Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. According to a poll conducted by the Palestinian Center for Public Opinion, it showed a degree of disillusionment among Palestinians over hopes that talks launched in July with Israel will bear fruit. However, there has been some optimism expressed at the frequency of visits by the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. What are the hopes for any kind of agreement in 2014? What has been achieved this year between Israel and the Palestinian side? To discuss this and the issues surrounding it, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Sarah Colburn, Director of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Also here in the studio is Professor Yossi Merkelberg, Program Director of the International Relations and Social Sciences at Regents University and Associate Fellow at Chatham House. And also here, Jonathan Sachodolti, a Middle East analyst on the line from Tel Aviv. I'm pleased to be joined by Professor Ilan Pape, who's Director of the European Centre for Palestine Studies at Exeter University. I mean, how would you assess the year for the Palestinians? I think that it's begun and ended with tragedy in Gaza. They were picking up the pieces from Israel's military war on Gaza at the end of 2012. Now you have some disastrous weather that has flooded Gaza, but it's been exacerbated by the fact that Palestinians are still under a brutal siege. Even before the weather hit Gaza, you had Palestinian school kids having to wade through sewage because Israel bombed the infrastructure and refused to allow sufficient concrete to rebuild. The whole undercurrent of uh, the discussions on negotiations is always the, the issue around justice for Palestinians, equality, human rights, rights and an end to occupation are those basic values that Palestinians are demanding. And I think so. I think the situation has has deteriorated very, very badly for Palestinians. You've had a significant amount of settlement building, illegal settlement building. The increase in terms of opposition to that um, has been quite a, po- a promising development. Jonathan, do you see it that way? It's been an interesting year in the region, certainly. I mean, not just for the Israelis and the Palestinians, but also beyond, of course. What's been interesting has been the refocusing of world opinion uh, and, and the world's attention on the region, because previously there's been a great deal of concentration on the decades-old conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And now, of course, with Syria in the dire situation that it is, with Egypt witnessing such upheaval, and it's clear that you know the Middle East is far more than just Israelis and Palestinians. I would say the great optimism of the year has been the renewal of the talks uh, the, with John Kerry's frequent visits to the region. But the renewed emphasis that, of Kerry's frequent visits could be something that could lead, hopefully, to something uh, which is brighter. Uh, Yossi, there has been a flurry of, of US-led diplomatic activity between Washington, Jerusalem, Ramallah. What do you make of John Kerry's frequent visits? Does it show a kind of commitment? Well, some will say commitment, others will say naivete, but it depends how you look at it. I think there is a commitment. For the first time for a long, long time, there is a Secretary of State that believes that with American full commitment, visiting the Middle East and, and, and dealing with very difficult protagonists there, there is a chance to reach the spring with some sort of, of an agreement. But it's really kind of flying uh, optimism on the reserves there. You see, every time that you address a major issue, one of the core issues, last week it was the, the, the issue of security arrangements uh, along the, the Jordan Valley, at the end of the day you need sides that are both willing and capable of taking a very difficult uh, peace process to a finishing line. And that's, I think, when John Kerry will find very quickly that they find it very difficult to show leadership and to sign an agreement and to say, okay, that's the best that we can do. Both of us are not really happy, maybe equally unhappy with an agreement, but it's better to continue the conflict. And comes April, comes the spring, John Kerry will have to decide, is it a point to continue the negotiation if there is no peace of agreement, or this is the time for the United States probably to take the back seat. Professor Ilan Pape, what do you make of John Kerry's attempts? Do you see that the US is genuinely seeing the, stu- the two-state solution a- as a viable one? I do think that they still see the two-state solution as a viable solution, but I think that even among the chief policymakers uh, in Washington, the recognition that this uh, solution is going to be very difficult to achieve it is penetrating. Uh, it definitely has penetrated the level of the strategic thinkers, namely in the CIA, the national security level, and so on. In many ways, it may be the last attempt or a serious attempt. I think they themselves understand that the chances for this are very low. Why do they do it if they know that it's bound to fail? 
is because they believe that a process, even a process that leads to nowhere, is better than the status quo. The problem with this approach is that if you try it for the first time, it's good, and even if, even if you try it for the second time, it's not too bad. But if you have been trying it for the last 20 years, you lost your total credibility as a mediator, and the Americans have zero credibility in this part of the world. And therefore, this is really much more a uh, charade that is meant to help the American administration, the Israeli government, and maybe the beleaguered PA, but this has nothing to do with the genuine effort. Jonathan, the US has no credibility, and it's, this is all a charade. What's your view? It's an interesting point, because you know the commentators are noticing a US pivot away from the Middle East, as some would put it, and it could be an example of how that might play out. And as Professor Meckelberg has said, you know, it might be that Kerry's, uh, he calls it naivety, let's call it uh, for the sake of being charitable optimism, is uh, unfounded and that really, you know, the same thing will happen now as every other time. I, I suppose the constant hope is that that won't be the case. It's, it's a sort of fair assumption that if there are no talks going on, then there can be no final status agreement. However, it is true that the US is pivoting away from the Middle East in many ways. It's certainly changing its relationship with many Middle Eastern powers. And it's certainly true, as Professor Pape just said, that it's a question of seeing who this is good for. Is this good for the Palestinian Authority? Uh, does it somehow bolster them when Mahmoud Abbas has no remaining democratic mandate. Is there much point in a negotiation that's going on between Israel and less than half of the Palestinian leadership when we're in a situation where, of course, you have Gaza under Hamas rule, uh, where Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority has no influence at all? The question then remains that even if Israel releases prisoners, even if Israel shows its commitment to those talks. What kind of agreement could come out of such negotiations? And is it not time instead, perhaps, that the Palestinian people should be given the right to vote in their leadership? Uh, neither Hamas nor uh, the Palestinian Authority, with Mahmoud Abbas at its head, uh, have any democratic mandate remaining, if they ever did, just from the one election uh, far too long ago. So that when there are negotiations, something good can come out of any final status agreement. <laughs> You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. We're discussing the prospects for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians in 2014. With me is Sarah Colburn, Director of Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Jonathan Sachadotti, Middle East Analyst, Professor Yossi Meckelberg, Associate Fellow at Chatham House, and on the line from Tel Aviv, Professor Ilan Pape, Director of the European Centre for Palestine Studies. There are a couple of points raised there. One is around the Palestinian democratic mandate. And obviously the Palestinians did have an election, as Jonathan refers to. The results of those, that election in 2006 um, were systematically ignored and actually uh, there was a blockade put on, on um, Gaza by Israel. And so I think that the problem is it's the occupation stupid, to, to paraphrase a remark by Obama. You can't ignore the fact that Palestinians are living under a brutal Israeli occupation and you can't ignore the fact that to have any negotiations with any possible positive uh, result, you need to have partners who actually are negotiating in good faith. And the trouble is that while Israel is negotiating, it's carrying on building settlements. But may I just say, it's strange to hear somebody who's a representative of something called a Palestine Solidarity Campaign happy with a situation where a seven-year ago election elected into power a brutal terrorist regime Don't over the Palestinian me. people. I did, not say I, was ha- I did not say I was happy. I simply explained the facts of the situation. Is the Palestinian people are living under an occupation. There was an election in 2006. They delivered a result that Israel and the EU ignored. It's so up to the Palestinians to determine their leadership. By your own admission, there's a lapsed democratic mandate for a terrorist organisation which is persecuting the peoples of Gaza, the Palestinian people in Gaza. And all I simply said before that which prompted that statement from you. If I, if I misrepresented it, my apologies. Um, it certainly sounded to me like uh, that seemed OK to you. And I don't think it is OK for the people of the Gaza Strip to be ruled over by that organisation and an organisation which continues to deny that there should be a state of Israel, an organisation which continues to allow for rockets to be launched into Israel. And those are the things which need to be sorted out. Okay. If there okay. are two we're go, sides where people are going to recognise each other's justified legitimacy, and if both if we, sides can't... If we, 
if we want just to let Jonathan... me finish one moment i didn't interrupt you i think the basic bare bones of the the situation are that obviously there's a conflict with lots of existing things that both sides don't agree on whether they're settlements whether it's using of concrete that is allowed into the gaza strip to build a huge terrorist tunnel that is designed for kidnapping israelis whatever the actual issues being discussed are if there aren't two sides which can trust each other and which can both recognize each other's rights to exist and israel has said that it recognizes the right of a Palestinian state for Palestinian people, but it wants to hear in return the Palestinians' representatives, whether they be from Hamas or from the Palestinian Authority, uh, it wants to hear that there should be an Israel for Jewish people. And until that exists, I don't think that any of these details over the perfectly valid conversation that we can have over the individual issues, I don't think that those will get us to a final status which will bring a bright future but for we, either we side. Are, we are missing two issues. One is the fact that there must be different arrangement, political arrangement about the Palestinians, because this it's not viable for the Palestinians to have two divided Correct. governments. Absolutely. That's a necessity to have, if they want to succeed in negotiation, they come with, need to come with a united front. This is, I think, a rebel and this should be democratic. The other side of it, the West and Israel, the United States and Europe can preach to have democratic elections and we don't get the result that we want. Then we said, OK, so we are not playing game. There must be also on this side some agreement that the Palestinians are there to decide who they worked for, what the kind of government they would like. Even we are not always happy with that. But then also set the condition under what condition we can negotiate with. Uh, but be reasonable about this condition. At the end of the day, you always negotiate with your enemies. You don't negotiate with your friends. Whether we like the Hamas, we don't like the Hamas, they are the partner that was elected. And uh, I think the week that uh, Nelson Mandela was there, I think one of the legacies of Mandela, he told, he told the South African government, listen, I know I'm a problem for you. I was a terrorist, but this is your problem. This is not my problem. But the important thing about Mandela is he was willing to negotiate. Of course, Hamas maintains that it's not willing to negotiate. But, but, but sometimes you, you actually build your partners. Agreed. It's also, instead of rejecting them and posing, call them names all the time, how we actually build a, I agree. a, a partner. That's, that's the Under the conditions that violence is not part of negotiation. Okay, Sarah, and quickly, we, and then we'll yeah, go back to Professor Papin. And we Papin. do know that Hamas have been negotiating, so I think we need to deal with facts rather than how we would like them to be interpreted. And I do agree very much about the right of Palestinians to have fair and democratic elections, and that's something that's been systematically denied them. This issue that you are raising as well about, what, about a Palestinian state, what sort of Palestinian state, Jonathan? Are you talking about Ramallah and Rawabi as two tiny pieces? Surely anything should be based on human rights rights and international law. Israel uh, occupied illegally the land of the West Bank, East Jerusalem, Gaza in 1967. Ha Palestinians have made historic compromises for so long. Surely it is time for Israel to listen to the voices of the international community. It is time that those who support Israel's policies need to be honest with Israel and say, actually, this is playing really badly Sarah, on the international stage. can we agree stage? that any violation of human rights is wrong, whoever is actually committed them? Let's put standard to everyone and says, everyone that commit, I think this has to be universal. Whoever commits violation of human rights should actually been named and shamed, whatever it's Israel, Palestine. I think we, okay. it's, it, to play the kiss, you know, we sometimes play it like a football. Either we supporters of this or supporters of that. I think we should support values. I think occupation must come to an end. Violation of human rights must come then. Two state solutions should be established. It should be a viable Palestinian state. The Palestinians should decide who is leading them and not for the Israelis to decide. Ilan Pape, Nelson Mandela was, was invoked there. He's been buried. I'm just wondering, I mean, he did once say about Palestine, uh, your freedom and mine cannot be separated. I'm just wondering, is his example and his values, can it change attitudes? Can it? Is he a force for good in terms of uh, looking ahead to 2014? Yes, he is. Uh, I'm always surprised when my Israeli friends uh, invoke uh, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was a man who demanded that in a given country, people would have utter equality. In fact, the Mandela legacy for what is Israel and Palestine today is one democratic state. This kind of a solution, this kind of dismantling, not only of the Israeli occupation in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, but also about the of the apartheid regime that Israel maintains inside the 67 borders and a fair solution to the refugee question. This is something that, of course, is a Mandela legacy that we have very few people inside Israel who support it. It might prove to be, in the end of the day, the only possible solution, but we have a long way to go there. The second Mandela legacy is uh, his own 
understanding and that of Desmond Tutu and many others who served with him on the ANC. It's very interesting that whenever they have visited the West Bank, they found the situation there far worse than that of apartheid South Africa. So we have an international responsibility, a human responsibility, to end this atrocity and strive together with the international community to reframe the relationship between the Jews, who are, after all, the settler community, as I said, the fourth generation, and the native people of Palestine. What about, I mean, fair, what about uh, fair elections? There was a mention there of a, of a democratic deficit. Uh, that the Palestinians have an issue with the representation that they have to solve. I fully agree with this. But that issue is beyond the question of the Hamas and the Fatah. Half of the Palestinian population are not in Palestine. The Palestinian population that are citizens of Israel, and some of them are being subject, have been subject in the last year to uh, policies of ethnic cleansing in the south and expropriation of land uh, in the north, uh, are also part of their question of representation. In other words, we have a peace process that is based on assumptions which are obsolete. And we have to build a reconciliation, reconciliation process which is far more in accordance with the realities on the ground. So in many ways, the Mandela legacy and the South African legacy becomes even more relevant because the two-state solution is not something that comes out from a South African historical example. that comes from Kashmir, maybe. We need this historical and political model if we are brave enough to say the two-state solution has actually died, nobody has invited us to the funeral. And I spent this sabbatical year of mine here on the ground, mostly in the West Bank, and I can tell you that the reality is at the five minutes of a visit would make you a great skeptic about any chance for a two-state solution here. You're listening to The Voice of Russia with me, Brandon Cole. We're discussing what hopes there are for an agreement between Palestinians and Israelis in 2014. Jonathan, some would say that Netanyahu has little interest in direct negotiations with the Palestinians. Well, I I don't really understand that, bearing in mind he's engaged in negotiation with the Palestinians. I think we have to take things as they are rather than uh, as... You know, some people might paint them. But no, no, but no negotiations would bear fruit unless um, unless settlement building stopped, though, right? Well, no, neg- you could similarly say no negotiations will bear fruit until violence is properly renounced and security situations is properly dealt with. The point is all of these perfectly valid discussions about settlements, about violence, about incitement, about whatever, these things have to be applied across the board to both sides. The way you sort out those issues is through mm. negotiation. And I think that Netanyahu contrary to what many might like to say about the man, has proven that he is committed to those negotiations, whether it's because of uh, political expediency and realizing that it's something he needs to do in terms of international recognition of Israel's legitimacy, or whether it's something that he needs to do in terms of his own electorate, or whether it's something to do out of a genuine desire within his heart to see a Palestinian state for Palestinian people existing alongside an Israeli state for Jewish people. I can't mind read exactly what his motivation is, but I would say that he's in my opinion, shown quite a commitment to those negotiations taking place. He's not. He's also put Zippy Livni in charge of the negotiations, mm-hmm. who's considered a fairly well-respected figure internationally. I think the release of prisoners has been, again, another gesture that perhaps has been very difficult to take in, in Israel. So you're right, didn't get everything that was wanted in terms of settlements, did get some things that were wanted in terms of prisoner releases. But I think the important thing is the negotiations should take place. And unlike Professor Pape, I don't think it's, it is quite time for us to throw out the idea of a two-state solution. It's, it depresses me to hear people say that because I do think that the alternatives are still uh, not uh, better and I do think that this is the desire among most people whose opinions I respect is to see two states existing so that both peoples can live side by side. The talks have five months left and I think in that sense it's rather unconstructive for us to chuck them out and to write them off at this stage. I, th- I think those talks need support and need to be taken seriously. If we poo-poo them while they're happening, then really there can be no hope. You were Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation, so you do have a particular take on this. But if you still believe that these negotiations are being, ta- are, are being carried out in good faith by Israel, how you can justify the continued expansion of settlements on the ground? Well, I'm not here to justify anything like that. That's my point, Sarah. I think the argument I'm making is that we have to look at the situation as it is and we have to look at the facts as they are. That is happening as are rocket attacks, as are 
the stabbing of a 19 year old Israeli on a bus Absolutely. by Palestinians and, and all, all these of- let me answer your question <laughs> don't always interrupt these things are actually happening and what we need to do is try to uh, establish a climate in which both sides have enough faith in one another in order to continue negotiations and at the moment they are continuing those negotiations without the freeze of settlement building which was the previous precondition and which was put in place for the nine months and actually during that nine month period when Netanyahu introduced a settlement freeze, the Palestinian Authority didn't return to negotiate until the last two months. So this time there's no freeze in place and they have returned under pressure on both sides from John Kerry in the US. I completely understand your perfectly valid points to discuss these issues. They need to be discussed. OK, uh, Professor Meckelberg, I'd, I'd like to get your view on the US aspect to this. The spat between Israel and the US over Iran, where Mr Netanyahu called the agreement with Iran a historic mistake. This isn't quite keeping in with US opinion and even fa- perhaps Jewish opinion within the US. I'm just wondering how much of a factor this is in terms of this has worsened relations between the US and Israel and will this have an impact on what happens with the Palestinian question? I must admit, usually Netanyahu plays the American policy domestic and internationally quite well. I think in the last few months he's I see more hysteria than history in the way that he reacts to everything. At the end of the day in Iran, if one looks at the agreement and bother to read it before reacting to that, you say that the Iranians actually agreed to give up the nuclear weapons or the possibility of, of developing nuclear weapons. It's an issue of trust, whether they trust enough the Iranians to do or not to cheat. So what Netanyahu should have probably said, I would like to see a verifiable process that the international community guaranteed that there is no develop of, of uh, nuclear weapons. Instead of that, he kept the same mantras that go on in, within Israeli strategies, among Israeli strategies. For 10 years, no nuclear development, 5%, 20%. Against the international community, and he actually pushed himself into a corner. What Israel is going to do if the international community says this is an agreement we accept, going to attack Iran against the will of the international community, he left himself no room to maneuver politically, and at the same time, going against the major ally, almost the only ally, in the, for Israel in the, in the international community. I don't think it was very clever. If you look at the more general view of Israel, on the one hand there is the Arab Spring and the Israelis themselves admit that they are, it was a humbling experience. They have no idea how to react to this. There is a sense that there is something big is happening in the Middle East, but they have no impact on this. On Iranian, this is a complete no, even if it's 5% enrichment, 20% for military use or not military use. On the Palestinians, again, there is no readiness, and the, and the settlements is important. It's, it's not something that we can sweep under, under, the, under the carpet. It's, it's symbolic. It's also about what the Palestinians see when they wake up in the morning and they see more cranes. Mm. So when you are un- un- most of the international community on almost every issue, I think Netanyahu is pushing Israel into isolation. One of the points we haven't discussed has been the EU position. Because I think that obviously we talk about the US as a player and what we haven't covered here um, is the situation in the EU around uh, the guidance around funding projects in settlements, the guidance that's taken place within individual EU states such as this this country, uh, Britain. And so I think that things are moving out with the, the negotiations taking place uh, that the US sponsored. Um, in terms of the Arab Spring, I mean, obviously, Palestinians um, say themselves that they were part of the first Arab Spring in terms of fighting for uh, for their freedom, um, for equality, uh, for their human rights. And so I think it I think this is a process that's unfolding. But I do believe that when people say Palestine and the issue of the core of the Palestinians is at the heart of the matter in the Middle East, that is not going to change because those fundamental issues that we all take for granted, those sort of rights are denied Palestinians. And I think until they get those those basic rights of equality, freedom, then we will be in this situation. On the Arab Spring point, um, Professor Pape in Tel Aviv, uh, I mean, Mohamed Morsi has been overthrown uh, in Egypt. I'm just wondering how much of an effect that had for the Palestinians' cause. Clearly, in 2014, we're going to see a lot more happening in the region, in particular with Syria. Yes, well, I think we are in the uh, beginning of a, of a huge uh, transformation in the Middle East, and it would be... Uh, very difficult to predict exactly how it will develop and uh, when the next big uh, earthquake uh, will happen. For many, many years, the societies in the Arab world felt that their governments do not represent them well when it comes to the issue of Palestine. 
and in some cases, the Arab Spring itself was triggered, among other things, by this sense that had the regimes been more democratic, they would have taken a tougher line against Israel. That's one possible scenario. Of course, it doesn't look like it. What we have now is a turmoil and external powers or factors uh, exploiting uh, this uh, human impulse for change to their own advantage, and, and the result so far is, is horrible. But Israel is not uh, a fortress that can be in the middle of the Middle East and not be part of its uh, historical uh, revolutions and changes. And when they would come, the very idea of a Jewish ethnic state at the heart of the Arab world would not be one that history would tolerate, I think, in any uh, possible scenario. So I think Israelis are, uh, despite their superiority in military terms, technological terms, and the support, uh, unconditional support they still get from the United States, have to think very seriously, would have seriously to think about the identity and future of the Jewish state within this changing Arab world. And it's better to do it now uh, rather than when things collapse uh, behind you. There's a pattern in American policies in the Middle East with regard to Israel that sometimes is missed by, by commentator and analysts. Israelis have so far a, a carte blanche to do whatever they want on the Palestine issue. The West Bank and the Gaza Strip, basically for Americans, is a domestic Israeli issue. America does not allow Israel to impact its policies elsewhere in the Middle East. And I think that's where Netanyahu was very different from other Israeli prime ministers. He tried to interfere, uh, or rather violate, the agreement that already was struck between President Ford and the Israeli government that uh, rega with regards to American policy in the Arab world, Israel has no impact. Uh, with regards to Israeli policy towards Palestine, America's impact is very minimal. And I think this is where he uh, was wrong, and probably a different Israeli government would not have done, would not have acted so stupidly. Jonathan, there's several months to go in negotiations. Do you have any optimism that um, this time next year we could be looking at a very different uh, scenario? All I can say is I hope so. You know, I'm very much somebody who wishes to see things uh, resolved in the region, who wishes to see reconciliation, as I, I'm sure we all are here. So I think that that's... That is the hope. Whether I, I'm optimistic in real times, obviously I'm a, I'm a realist. And so it doesn't look to me uh, like it will be uh, everything sorted out in five months' time. But let's hope. Yossi Meckelberg, are you optimistic? I think it's more un it's unlikely that it will achieve a peace agreement within the time framework. But, you know, there is always room for, for a surprise. And I think if we start by talking about American credibility, maybe the EU credibility, I think if the United States and the EU uh, will put their mind together, mm. they can restore their credibility and probably help the Israel and Palestinians to save themselves from themselves. Sarah, you started this discussion uh, in uh, describing how the end of 2013 was just as bad as the start of 2013 for the Palestinian cause. Do you see any difference in 2014? Yeah, I do think that we are in a different situation in the sense that international solidarity, international concern is at greater heights than ever before and I think that Israel needs to pay good attention to that. That's Sarah Colburn, Director of Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Also here in the studio, Professor Yossi Meckelberg, Programme Director of International Relations and Social Sciences at Regents University and Associate Fellow at Chatham House. And also here, Jonathan Sachadotti, Middle East Analyst. And on the line from Tel Aviv, Professor Ilan Pape, Director of the European Centre for Palestine Studies at Exeter University. Many thanks for joining me, Brendan Colt, on the Voice of Russia in London.